Pastor, I was asked to come and talk to you about a new insect pest of soybeans that we've been experiencing the last several years in, in the southeast, and, and I'm going to do so. Uh, the first thing I've got here is I, I bought a little time-lapse camera and stuck it on a fence post and pointed it at a soybean field. We planted, and uh, we took a picture every day. Anybody, you ever seen that before? Uh, it's kind of interesting. I'll just play it. It only takes like 15 seconds for it to show you the whole season. Uh, you'll notice some weeds there as my technician kind of comes in and mows the weeds down. They grow back up real fast and he mows them down. Uh, so let's just play that. I don't know how well you can see this back there. You can notice all the rain we had in South Carolina because it often was raining. Anyhow, that's, that's a whole soybean crop. <laughs> 15 seconds, I thought it was pretty neat. All right, uh, click the next one. All right, so we're going to talk about kudzu bugs. As I mentioned, we've been experiencing this insect for uh, several years now in the, in the southeast, and I'm going to kind of take you through just about the, the entire history of it being here and, and what we found out about it. Uh, first of all, we'll make, go out on a limb make a prediction. You guys will get kudzu bug. You don't have it yet, but you will get it. It will become established. It'll be a nuisance pest, and it's going to be a pest of soybeans. Uh, it's just a um, matter of time. Uh, out on the, the, the sign-up table out front, there are some publications that the United Soybean Board helped us uh, put together, and it's kind of a good introductory um, piece on, on kudzu bugs, so, so pick up, the, I think I brought 130, so grab them while they're still out there. Um, there are some uh, other sources of information. You go to these websites, there's, there's an up-to-date map of the distribution. It's updated regularly, uh, so you can check that out. There's some other information there about kudzu bugs. All right, just a little bit about the, the species and what it looks like. Uh, you've got egg masses laid in two rows. The immatures hatch from those and, and develop through five instars, much like stink bugs, and um, before they become adults. Give you an idea about the, the size of the adults. They're about the size of, a, of an eraser on a, on a pencil, you know, about the same size as a, as a lady beetle. Uh, just some other shots of the, of the immatures and, and the adults, the male and female, and the egg mass. It's, it's unlike anything else you will see in, in soybeans. Now, you will see this insect in large numbers on non-legume hosts. It'll, it'll rest on anything in large numbers and, and almost look like it's feeding and, and, uh, and hurting that host plant. Uh, but its preferred hosts are legumes. Soybeans, kudzu is a legume, wisteria is a legume, uh, peanuts is a legume, but interestingly, this insect doesn't, doesn't like uh, peanuts. You can find it on peanuts, but it doesn't use it as a reproductive host. So um, kudzu is its uh, preferred wild host, and um, the, the kudzu bug, incidentally, is not its approved common name. That's just what we call it, because you, if you go on a kudzu patch, it's, it's in the kudzu patch uh, in an infested area. So you're going to find it on, on kudzu first. Uh, it, it's actually a good guy on kudzu. Uh, there's a published a paper already that uh, it reduces kudzu growth by 30%. So it's actually a biocontrol agent of kudzu. Not going to eradicate kudzu, not going to get rid of kudzu, it just feeds on it, slows the growth down. Um, kudzu occurs in a, in a very large portion of the United States, pretty much where we grow soybeans, the, the whole eastern half of the country. So those two hosts overlap nicely for this insect. You can find it early. Uh, this is an early May uh, picture. Uh, this, those are just early vegetative soybeans like V2, and, and they're just covering every, every stalk in the field. So they can get pretty, pretty uh, abundant quick. And at the end of the season, they can be really, really thick uh, if you don't do anything about it. Here are just some sweep net numbers. I mean, literally in a dozen sweeps, you can have several thousand of these insects in an infested area. Can you click? This is another video. This is a video um, my, one of my graduate students took about, I don't know, a dozen sweeps in an infested area of this field. It's pretty dramatic. You see these things just boiling out of the sweep. <laughs> Abundant. I wish that would play. 
All right, this is where kudzu bug is from. It's from Asia. That's where we get a lot of our uh, invasive species. Uh, very nice of them to provide those for us. Uh, the one we have is probably from Japan. Uh, there's some genetic evidence and, and looking at the micro uh, endosymbionts uh, seems to indicate what we have came from Japan. But they've been here since 2009. Uh, they're found on some homes next to a kudzu patch. Uh, this insect likes to color white. So it, it's going to be on your truck if it's white. It's going to be on your house, the, the, uh, the trim work if it's white. And, and that's what was found initially. It was limited to these nine counties in northeast Georgia in 2009. We checked around, and, and this was the, the limit of its distribution in late 2009. This is a picture of, uh, of where we got uh, with the distribution of this insect uh, the end of last year, 2013. Uh, it's in multiple states, all the way in, uh, completely in, infested South Carolina, North Carolina, most of Georgia, all of Alabama. It's into Mississippi, and it's over to the river, and it's just a matter of time before you got it here in Arkansas. Uh, some of the limitations, as you can imagine, for distribution of this insect, probably the mountain ranges here, but it's going to be just a matter of time before this thing funnels up and gets, gets into some big soybean acres, and then it'll be limited probably by temperature only. Right now, you can find this insect overwintering. Uh, it overwinters much like uh, a lot of our species of stink bugs, wherever it can get to survive the temperatures, and that's under leaves, behind bark, in your attic, uh, just wherever the insect can get. Um, you can find it around windows, you can find it uh, very abundantly in and around um, homes where you've got infested plants or had infested plants. This is kudzu, the terminal growth of kudzu, and this is what happens uh, when kudzu starts to green up. They start laying egg masses around the terminals and start colonizing this, this favorite host plant. And then you've already seen this picture. Uh, they can move straight into soybeans. If you've got early planted soybeans, we don't have a lot of early planted soybeans uh, out in the southeast, and I under, as I understand it, you guys have a lot of those. Uh, this insect doesn't have to have kudzu to uh, survive. As long as there are early planted soybeans, it'll come straight out of overwintering sites as adults and move right into early planted soybeans. So I, I think you've got kind of a perfect storm <laughs> set up for this insect out here in the, in the mid-south. Then it uh, migrates in large numbers uh, to soybeans uh, about mid-summer, and it can get very abundant early on. Uh, the eggs are, are laid primarily uh, under leaves, uh, and you can find a lot of egg masses out there. It's uh, very distinct, uh, two rows. I think the red banded stink bug also lays eggs in two rows, but it's, uh, the, these, the egg masses are very distinct. The eggs are kind of uh, pushed over to the side, if you will. The nymphs have this uh, kind of fuzzy appearance, and again, they go through five stages on the way to the adult stage. They can be very numerous in the field, as you've seen all the way up to harvest uh, inside the combine. Um, I mean, these things just hang out in the field and uh, they're just slow to move to overwintering sites. All right, so how does this insect feed? It's not a, it's not a leaf chewer. It's, it doesn't feed on the pods. This thing is a stem feeder, much like the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. It's, it just feeds on the stems, the petioles, uh, and it's a stress-inducing pest. It's another factor out there that stresses the plant. And it can reduce pods per plant, seeds per pod, and, and seed size, and, and we did a, uh, a series of cage experiments to kind of uh, look at that, and, and what we found is when we infested plants at uh, different growth, st uh, different densities of this insect, um, we did this at mid-vegetative, -veg and then at R6, we, we went in and counted the number of bugs we have, and in an initial infestation of five bugs and 25 bugs per plant, you can see we had uh, quite quite a few more insects in those cages, and that did translate, when we looked at yield, that tra did translate into a sea weight reduction, uh, kind of a linear <laughs> relationship with, uh, with density. Uh, so the insects could cause yield loss uh, at these, these levels. Uh, and pretty much this just shows seeds per pod were affected, individual seed weight in that year, and the same thing the second year, seeds per pod and individual seed weight were significantly affected. Uh, by uh, these different densities. We published a paper on this. You can read more about the, the cage work. A colleague in Georgia infested some very small vegetative stage uh, soybeans for two weeks, and then he uh, measured plant height. And, and these things were stunting plants at five and a half bugs per plant, almost nine per plant, uh, just for two weeks worth of feeding. So uh, they can affect uh, the, the growth of, of the soybean for sure. He saw the same thing in another experiment uh, where they infested uh, at different levels and, and saw a height reduction with this insect. But 
uh, those early infestations we've learned are not as uh, detrimental as the, the reproductive infestations. He didn't see a difference in yield uh, where he saw a difference in, in height from those early feeding. So uh, it, takes, it takes a while for the populations to get going to put enough stress on the plant to hurt yield. Population dynamics, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about uh, spatial distribution of this insect. I just want to point out a few things. Um, in fact, I don't, I don't really know what I want to point out on this. It's kind of a messy chart. You can see the eggs here, uh, kind of around R2, R3, kind of a, a, a bump there. Kind of the same situation here on another field where they're uh, colonizing the field, laying eggs. But we, we think that's a magical time for this insect, at least in, in the southeast. The early reproductive stages, R2, R3, seems to be a, a preferred um, crop phenology for this insect. Uh, another observation from studying the spatial distribution of this insect is that they're, they're generally aggregated, a lot like our stink bugs, and we find greater densities on the field edges, particularly early on. So this has implications for management. If this insect's going to show up in large numbers on the edges of the field, what are you going to do? Nobody? Spray the edges, right? So uh, you probably could save a lot of money by spraying field borders initially for this insect, and, and we're going to work on some of that research uh, this season. Uh, just a, some interpolation maps showing you how the populations can get very, very thick around the edges of fields. So uh, I think that's a real deal, a real biological uh, thing that we can exploit. We've published a paper on some of the, the spatial distribution of this insect already. This is an interesting chart from a colleague in Georgia, and it basically just shows population uh, over time in kudzu, and what I, the only thing I want to point out on this chart, and these are eggs, the blue, is notice how they just stop laying eggs around the end of July. Uh, they just pretty much quit. There are two generations with this insect. So if you can manage both of those generations, um, I, I think we'll do a pretty good job. That, that's probably going to mean one or two insecticide applications to control this insect. All right, so how do we control it? Chemical control, I'm going to show you some efficacy information. This is from 2011. Uh, most of these charts are going to show kudzu bugs per 20, 25 sweeps, 10 sweeps, or uh, a number per row foot. And, and of course, the products are going to be across here. Most of the charts are going to be broken up by adults and nymphs. And um, the only thing I really want to point out on a lot of these FC charts is that the, the materials that have a pyrethroid insecticide seem to do the best job on controlling this insect. I could sum it up with that, but we're going to go through some of these charts. And, and I could pick out some of the pyrethroids here, some of the LET materials, tracer, belt, just don't have activity on this insect. Take that out a little bit later. This is at R7, a couple of days after the third application. And again, you can see where the pyrethroid um, compounds, what they've done, and even some pretty good control out of a, out of a neonic and uh, dimethoate here. Another trial, uh, this is kudzu bugs per 12 row feet. Look at that, almost 1,000 per 12 row feet. Uh, these are all a pyrethroid. I'll have a pyrethroid. This is seven days after the second application at R5, so everything's doing a fine job there. Another trial, uh, pretty much everything in this test is a, is a pyrethroid except for a fungicide alone here. Uh, that was just another marker in this test. And again, this is a pretty good number uh, of bugs per 12 row feet. Here's another test. A um, couple of neonics here, rate response brigade at four ounces. This is bifenthrin, and, and that seems to be the most active compound, the most active pyrethroid. Uh, on this insect, and that's, that's very fortunate for producers because it's very cheap uh, by Fenthrin. Um, and then there's some other products in here that uh, provided uh, variable control, but again, the pyrethroid compounds, uh, and there are some exceptions there, some subtle differences between some of the pyrethroids, and in fact, there are some that don't work well at all. Uh, here's another trial, and, and another thing I want to point out on this is that all these products right here have got by in them, uh, so they all look pretty good. This is imidacloprid by itself. Uh, so imidacloprid is a miss on this insect. Uh, and that's a, that's a pretty good rate of it. Uh, pyrethroid in this product, uh, this has actually got a pyrethroid and imidacloprid in it. It was a little weak uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and, and again, just some more efficacy charts. Here's uh, Discipline, which is uh, a bifenthrin. Did a really good job on, on kudzu bugs. Uh, for you cotton guys, uh, transform is your plant bug material. Um, doesn't work on, on kudzu bugs, and I'm pretty sure that doesn't have a label in soybeans, but it was in this test just as a, as a marker, and carbines, another uh, cotton product, no activity on this insect, limited activity. All right, so this final chart on uh, insecticide efficacy in the field is just kind of a, uh, a summary of uh, several years' worth of work, and, and all of the, the, the products that provide very good control of this, this insect 
at least the ones, the top three here have bifenthrin in them. Uh, very active, uh, active ingredient on this insect. And then there are some other pyrethroids that uh, provide pretty good control. Uh, you get down to some of these caterpillar materials and they just they don't have activity on this insect. All right, so how long does that activity last? What about the residual control? So we looked at um, uh, petri dish assays where we sprayed uh, plants and we brought the leaves in at different times after we sprayed and then exposed those leaves to, to the insects. And uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on this either, but this is hours after insecticide application. This is uh, percent mortality. Uh, this is bifenthrin. Uh, and this is acephate, uh, orthene, and we had pretty good control with the, the bifenthrin extending out over a week or so, uh, and it was pretty much gone with the acephate early on, basically what that says. That, that was adults looking at nymphs. It was pretty much the same thing. We had extended residual control with the pyrethroids, and you guys see that on other insects as well. So that's good to know. Biological control of this insect. We don't get a lot of help from um, nature with this insect. Um, there are some fungal pathogens that attack insects in general, uh, but this, we looked at, uh, at this particular one, Bavaria bassiana, last year, commercial formulations of it, lab prepared form formulations, and uh, it's not gonna be something we can rely upon. In fact, I don't think the organic producers are gonna be able to use something like that to control uh, this insect. Predators, uh, it's a lot like stink bugs. It just evades a lot of predation. Uh, defensive chemicals secreted by uh, nymphs in, in aggregate. Uh, it just, they just don't have a lot of predators. Parasitoids, here's where we're probably gonna get some help from, from nature. Uh, there's a small little wasp that attack, attacks just the eggs of kudzu bugs. That's all it does. Uh, we studied this thing in quarantine, uh, in, working with a scientist uh, in Mississippi. And we were planning on uh, releasing this parasitoid this year. And then the parasitoid showed up in the United States, attacking the insect. So uh, I think we're constantly bombarded with these invasive species uh, they're just coming into the country, even the uh, natural enemies. Uh, so this thing is already established, uh, and it's going to exert some natural control on this insect. Uh, it, can, it can be some very good control. Here's just a picture of that, that small little wasp and it coming out of, of some infest, infested eggs. All right, culture control. This is, uh, this is some really good information here about um, manages, managing this insect with planting date. Uh, variety and, and what we did for the last couple of years we, we had a trial we had different maturity groups different planting dates and we had sprayed and unsprayed multiple factors in this test very hard to keep uh, weeds under control Larry in, in this kind of situation but we found something that worked well uh, if you're going to wait two months with bare ground and come back and plant uh, we had a pretty good recipe for that anyhow um, let's set these up this is going to be bushels per acre at 13 percent moisture these are planting dates here this is treated three times with a uh, premixed product with the pyrethroid in it and then untreated. Uh, so on the maturity group fours, what we saw here is we saw a, a, a significant difference here uh, on the 20th of April planting. We saw a same significant difference on the 18th of May where we planted then. And then the significant difference was gone uh, where we planted on the 5th of July with the maturity group fours. Looking at the maturity group fives, it was pretty much the same thing where we planted early. We took a, a significant hit on yield. Where we planted in May, we took a significant hit, and where we planted the first week of July, it didn't matter if we sprayed or not sprayed for this insect. And you notice the eggs quit early. Remember, I showed you that chart? So this insect is an early season pest. Same thing with the group sixes. Uh, notice our yields are kind of going up for the southeast here with the sixes and sevens. That's why we grow them over there. Uh, significant difference here early and into May, and then no significant difference there, and the same with the sevens. So it's, a, it's an early season pest. It's gonna attack early season um, planted soybeans. Uh, the two generations, you're, you're exposing that crop to two generations of this insect, so it makes sense. Uh, kind of looking at these data differently, just uh, grouping them by uh, planting date. You can just see uh, when we're, we're planting on the 20th of April, we took a significant uh, yield loss across the board for maturity group. Same thing for the 18th of May, significant difference across the maturity groups. And then when we plant on the 5th of July, uh, we didn't, it didn't matter if we sprayed three times or not for this insect. So, pretty clear. Uh, we did that again uh, this year, or last year, 2013, and uh, just notice the difference in these bars here as you go across from planting date. Uh, the differences are, are larger here early and then they start to erode as you, as you go through the season. So, uh, pretty clear uh, planting date effect with this insect. A colleague in Georgia did this, uh, a sim very similar trial. He saw the same thing. You can see the difference here erode with planting date. Notice a 76% difference in yield there. That's a lot, isn't it? 76%. Uh, and another trial, 
pretty much saw the same thing and, and so forth. Uh, and his trial last year, 73% difference in yield here, planted early and it erodes as the planting day extends. All right, now this piece of information also from Phil, Dr. Philip Robertson George is very interesting. He, he sprayed some plots. He had sprayed plots and unsprayed plots. And he sprayed one time. He sprayed on the uh, 30th of July with indigo at the, at the max rate. And then he went into his untreated plots and his treated plots and he just counted the insects over time. In the untreated plots, he counted them on the, on the 9th of August and, and all the way into September here, and you can see the populations increased. He did the same counts in his spray plots, and they never came back. So that, that late application there pretty much zeroed them out, and they weren't a factor uh, after the 30th of July in this test. He repeated this at another site and essentially saw the same thing. One spray on the 30th of July, and he counted in August and into September, uh, and, and they pretty much just didn't rebound from that late season application or mid season application. All right, so we've done a lot of work on treatment thresholds and, and, and some of this maturity group plant date work, and um, I don't have a lot of that work summarized yet. We've got to do more analyses on that to kind of nail down a threshold, but uh, we've looked at things like an untreated control, full protection, one bug per sweep, two bugs per sweep, one bug per sweep when nymphs present, and then a single application at uh, beginning pod fill, pod formation. And um, what we found out is that the key is to control the, the nymphs control the reproducing populations. If you can get in front of a, uh, of a population that's trying to develop in the field, you can do a pretty good job. We're gonna have a number uh, to put with that recommendation here pretty soon, but in this uh, publication, uh, we pretty much read that you've gotta time the applications for nymphs. Uh, one nymph per sweep using a sweep net, or I personally like a, an observation threshold where you go in the field and you just pull, push back the canopy and look. And if you can easily see uh, hatching nymphs, uh, and most of your observations, it's time to spray. Um, and once you kind of hit those things hard, you, you can evaluate later. And once nymphs come back, the second generation, you hit them again. Uh, so the pyrethroids provide good control. Um, there is going to be some reinfestation, particularly if you spray too early. Uh, and we showed some evidence that you probably don't need to spray too early. Uh, don't let soybean, uh, don't let kudzu bugs complete a generation on soybeans. The immatures are definitely important. And, um, I really, I really like this observation threshold. All right, so more information can be found at uh, cutsybug.org or our Clemson website, and um, I think that's pretty much it.